Well, good morning, church. Great to see you. Isn't the snow beautiful out there? It brightens things up. Uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of a gift. Well, it's good to see you. You're brightening up everybody's morning. Glad you're here today. We're in the second week of a series called Make It Count. If you've got a Bible, please turn with me to 1 Corinthians 13. If you don't have a Bible, just raise your hand and uh, ushers are coming on down the aisle. They'll be glad to, to pass you one. If you don't own a Bible, keep that one and uh, you can use it to grow in Christ uh, throughout the week. While they're doing that, uh, I just want to remark about how encouraging it is to have started the, the year together as a church in prayer. Last Tuesday, we prayed for God's mission and for own, our needs. You know, uh, the reality is we need the power of God in our lives to live the life of Jesus and to meet the challenges we face. So we also, as a church, if we're going to do his mission, we need his power. We can't do it on our own power. And so when we start our year in prayer, that's a very healthy place to be. And prayer and fasting, we're awakening the hunger, the hunger for God, uh, because we need him in our lives. And so I uh, look forward to having you join in with us Tuesday, uh, whether it's by Facebook or uh, right here live. Uh, it's a play, uh, just a great way to, to offer ourselves to God and to have him work in our lives. So uh, we have a new year in front of us. Stretching right out in front of us, 2019. How can we be sure that when we come to the end of this year, we will have made the most of it? How, how can we be sure that, you know, when we live out these next 355, whatever days it is, that um, we're not going to end up having wasted this year? Well, last week we saw that 1 Corinthians 13 tells us that the key to making our lives count is showing love. That if we don't show love, no matter what we do, it will amount to nothing. But if we do show love, whatever we do is going to have an eternal impact. So how do you show love? That's what we're going to look at today. 1 Corinthians 13 gets practical with us and what it means to show love. Now, uh, we hear this passage often read at weddings, but it's important to know this is really not about romantic love. It's not a bad thing to read it at a, at a wedding. We should practice 1 Corinthians 13 in our marriages, but this is really not written to couples. And it's not written just to encourage us to love our family, although we should practice 1 Corinthians 13 kind of love to our families. But it's actually about all the interactions we have with people throughout our week. All the interactions we have through life. This is what it looks like to show love. So we're going to get practical looking at some of the do's and don'ts today of how we show love. And over the next couple of weeks, we're going to take a look at what this chapter tells us. And we're going to start with verses 4 and 5 today. Verse 4 says, love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy it does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. So let's first start with the don'ts about love. This passage tells us do not compete with others. We can't love people and compete with them at the same time. Now, some kinds of competition are fine. They're, they're fun to see who can run the fastest to see who's the best at the video game, to, to see who wins at cards, whatever you like to do. That's fun kind of competition. The unhealthy kind of competition is less structured. It's about who is the superior person, who is more worth love. Now, that, that's not the competition that we want to run. Verses Verse 4 says, do not envy, love does not boast, love is not proud. To envy is to say, I want what you have. And to boast is to say, I have what you want. And to be proud is to say, I'm the best, I'm better than you. All of those are competition kinds of actions and that they don't mix with love. So why is it that we would envy? What drives us to boast? Well, in the end, it's because we boast because we're not confident that we're enough. We're not confident that we're worthy enough to be loved 
that we're not worthy enough to be significant. And so we have to make up for that. And if I'm afraid I'm not smart enough or good looking enough or whatever for people to value me, then I'm going to have to show them that I'm valuable by boasting. If I can boast and convince others or myself that I'm worthy, that I'm enough, then maybe that ache goes away. Or if I'm envious of somebody else, it's because I'm thinking they are more than me. I don't, I'm not enough. And so boasting and envy don't mix with love. They're insecurity. It's self-focused. And insecurity can lead us to play the one-up game. You know the one-up game. That's when you're, you know, talking with somebody and, and uh, whatever you say, they've got something better, right? You know, when we love somebody, we don't feel a need to compete with them. Uh, for example, you know, I love my kids and I'm delighted when they succeed. Uh, you know, I'm not like threatened that they'll, they'll succeed more than me. I'm actually very excited when they do really well and if they exceed, succeed more than me. That's awesome. On the other hand, this past week, <clears throat> I was uh, scrolling through Facebook and I came across a post from another pastor, uh, a pastor who was a former classmate of mine and we were in the doctoral program together. And so uh, he posted their church's Christmas Eve attendance and it was higher than ours. <clears throat> and so... I had to keep scrolling, you know. No, <clears throat> it, it, actually, I thought, Steve, what are you doing? You know, it's this is for good, wonderful for the kingdom. He's probably feeling great, <clears throat> great about that. So I went back and I made sure to push the like button on that post, you know, to say I'm, I'm with you. This is good, you know. What was happening? Well, I, I was, I got a competitive streak that just uh, slipped right in. That's not love. You see, when we love somebody, we're not going to compete against them. If we feel the need to boast, if we feel envy creeping in, what we need there, that's a sign that we need a refill of God's love in our lives. Because when God's love fills us, then we're free to give love around to other people. 1 John 4.19 says we love because he first loved us. When his love fills us, when we, when we know that we're his child and and we sense that we matter to him, then we feel like we're enough. We don't have to boast or feel envious because we're confident in that we are enough. And so we give it away. And so if you're a child of God, if you're a follower of Jesus, you are a child of God. And as a child of God, you've got nobody to impress and nothing to prove. You are enough. So, give that love away. Verse 4 says, no need to envy, boast, be proudful. Second, don't tear others down. That's the other do not in this how to love. It says, love does not dishonor others. Now, this seems kind of obvious. You know, we know that insulting somebody is not a way to show love. Attacking them or taking them down a peg doesn't doesn't mix with love, but sometimes we need to be reminded of what we already know, especially when the emotions kick in, and we might feel like they deserve to be taking a peg down or so, uh, and it might just kind of come out before we even know it. We start uh, tearing somebody else down. The Chicago Bears were playing the Philadelphia Eagles last weekend in the NFL playoffs, and it was a tight game. Uh, it went all the way down to the last play. The Eagles were winning 16-15. to but the Bears had moved the ball down into range for a medium-range uh, field goal. And so Cody Parkey, the kicker for the Bears, came, came trotting on to the field. And as he comes on to prepare to kick, the announcers are reminding us that earlier in the year, Cody Parkey had done a remarkable thing in that he hit the upright four times in one game. Uh, that's almost impossible to do. Most kickers go through a whole year and they never hit the upright. He did it four times in one game, uh, which is truly an amazing thing. So as he's getting ready to kick, we're hearing that, and um, the, it's a high-pressure kick. If the Bears, uh, you know, if the kick is good, the Bears win the, the, the game and they go on in, in the playoffs. If the kick fails, then the Bears go home, they lose. So... The snap comes, the ball's down, the kick goes up, and it goes right through the uprights for the game-winning field goal, except 
time had been called, so it didn't count. So they have to do it over again. A few minutes later, do the same thing, snaps back, balls down, kicks up, and it hits the post. Not just once, but twice. It hits it on the way down, hits the crossbar, bears lose. Thunderous boos rain out onto the field on Cody Park. He was, hangs his head. And the Eagles came swarming onto the field. They're celebrating their victory. Except for their kicker, Jake Elliott, he makes a beeline for Cody Parkey. He wanted to say, because Jake knew what it's like to miss a clutch field goal, and he wanted to encourage Cody Parkey, and he told Parkey, hey, that ball was tipped at the line. That's why he hit the post. And he, he was encouraging Cody Parkey. Why? Because he wasn't competing with him anymore. Uh, he was able to uh, express encouragement. He was able to do something like everybody else was tearing down Cody Parkey at that moment, th tens of thousands, but Jake Elliott wasn't, and he was trying to build him up. You see, that's what happens. Love doesn't tear down. Love builds up. The highest building in the world is the Burj Khalifa in Dubai. It's 2,717 feet high. That's a half mile in the air. I think they must have like re refreshment resupply for the elevator trip all the way up to the top because it takes so long to get there. You know, that's, that's an amazing thing. And, the, and the, the building project was astonishing. That five years into making incredible amount of resources and engineering, that's an impressive project. But you and I, we get to be involved in an even more impressive building project than that. You and I get to be involved in building up people. And that's what 1 Corinthians 8.1 says. Knowledge puffs up while love builds up. You see, we get to build others up by expressing and showing love. We don't need any kind of architectural expertise, and we don't need a permit to do it. We get to show love and build people in the process. Now, the Burj Khalifa's foundation is 146 feet deep. But the foundation for showing love, the foundation for our building project... It's found in verse 4. Love is patient. Love is kind. There it is. That's the foundation. We first build up others with kindness. When we love somebody, we're going to show kindness to them. Now let's get specific. What does this look like? What does kindness look like in action? Well, one, it means to show appreciation, to express gratitude and thanksgiving to somebody. You see, we can take people for granted, can't we? Um, but, it, for example, if you've got children and they're healthy, just walk through the children's hospital wards and some of the cancer wards, and then you'll go home and hug your kids a little tighter, so appreciative of their health. There's something uh, that, that, that makes us take people and blessings for granted at times. But to show kindness starts with showing some appreciation. And the reality is we might be thankful for people, we might be grateful for them, but unless we express it, They'll not know it. So, have you shown that kind of appreciation? Maybe to your spouse, to your kids, to the server uh, at your restaurant. It's not that hard, but it does take intentionality. Uh, second, show affirmation. Uh, that's telling people what they're good at. So, um, this is not blowing smoke. This is not like flattery, but it does help us to remember that sometimes people are blind to what they're good at. There's a saying, we were born on the wrong side of our eyeballs, so we can't see our strengths. And uh, we get to help others with that. I realized that I started Crossroads Church because somebody else saw in me a strength I didn't see in myself. People around you may not see what they're actually good at, but it can be pretty fun to actually tell them that. It can be pretty fun to point it out to them because it builds them up. So to say to your spouse, you know, you are a really good example and a great role model for our kids. That builds them up. Say, wow, you're really good at decision making. I've watched you. That builds them up. Or to say to your kids, I watched you really work hard at that. That's excellent to, to let them know. Or just to the server at your restaurant, you know, to say, it's amazing. You, you've been working for hours and you still have a smile on your face and you do all this hard work. Way, way to go. That's, I'm not sure I could do that. You know, that's, that's building people up. And affirmation 
gets to be a habit for us. That's a great habit to be in because when we're looking for people's strengths, we don't really pay attention to how to tear them down. So to be kind is to show appreciation and affirmation. And um, third is to give encouragement, which literally means to give encouragement means to, to give courage and to let people know you can do it. Maybe there's somebody in your life that builds you up, somebody that regularly encourages you. Uh, for me, it's my Aunt Susan. Now, I've not lived in, this, in the same vicinity as her, but uh, she has always been the most encouraging person I know. Uh, anytime I talk with her or read an email or a note from her, I just feel built up. She has this great way of exaggerating my strengths and ignoring my failures. I don't really try to help her be more realistic in her assessment. I'm just fine with that kind of interaction. In fact, I got an email from her last week, and I read it, and I showed it to Linda, my wife, you know, and I said, boy, well, you know, I just kind of feel better anytime I hear from Aunt Susan. And I understand why she was nominated for Teacher of the Year in her state. Why? Because anybody who spends time with her stands a little taller and just more convinced that, okay, I think I can, I think I can do what life is going to throw at me. Who is it that you are encouraging? You know, people need it. Fred Rogers has been called the greatest Pittsburgher in history. Uh, and uh, Tom Hanks is going to play him in a movie that's going to come out later this year. Fred Rogers, uh, of course, was the, the star of the television show Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Millions of people across the country for decades grew up watching Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Now, Fred Rogers is a different kind of TV star. He had a basic message that was really simple. It was about love and acceptance. But over the years, it had such an impact on so many people that prestigious universities around the country would give him honorary degrees, honorary doctorates because of his impact on people's lives. And uh, many asked him to speak. In fact, just a little less than two years before he passed away, uh, Marquette University asked Fred Rogers to give the commencement speech to their graduates. And uh, he did that. Now, uh, he was an ordained minister, and he talked about doing God's will on the earth, and he talked about the centrality of love. Uh, he said, you don't ever have to do anything sensational in order to love or to be loved. The real drama of life, that which matters most, is rarely center stage or in the spotlight. In fact, it has nothing to do with IQs and honors and the fancy outsides of life. And then he concluded with a very simple message given to a room full of highly accomplished academics. He gave a very simple message to those that are getting their degrees that day. And this is what he said. I'd like to give you the words of one of my favorite neighborhood songs. This song is called, It's You I Like. It's you I like. It's not the things you wear. It's not the way you do your hair. But it's you I like. The way you are right now, the way down deep inside you, not the things that hide you, not your diplomas, they're just beside you. But it's you I like, every part of you, your skin, your eyes, your feelings, whether old or new. I hope that you remember, even when you're feeling blue, that it's you I like. It's you yourself, it's you, it's you I like. Congratulations to you all. filled with hundreds, thousands of men and women who had masters, PhDs, who had studied the most complex ideas in, in human conversation. They gave a standing ovation to that very simple message. It's you I like. 
Whether they were librarians or linebackers, they all needed the same message, and so do you and I. That's core to us as human beings. We need to know. It's you I like. And you can offer that to somebody else. It's easier to offer it when you know it's true of you. And that's why it's so important for us to know God's love. Because God says to you today, it's you I like. God says to you, it's you I created. And because of that, you're deeply loved. And you can tell somebody else that. And that will give them a great encouragement. It will help them to stand taller. One other way to show kindness, and that's to offer help. See, um, this is what love looks like when it sees vulnerability or weakness or need. 19-year-old Joey Prusak was working at the Dairy Queen in, in uh, Minnesota. And he saw a blind man in line drop a $20 bill. And then he saw the woman behind that blind man pick up the $20 bill and put it in her wallet. And so he went out from around the counter and went to the woman and said, uh, please give that $20 bill back to this gentleman. And she refused, saying, no, it's my $20 bill. I, I dropped it. And he said, I, I saw you, this man drop it, and I saw you pick it up. Please give it back to him. And she refused, and she got indignant. And then he said, well, ma'am, if you do not give this $20 bill back, then I'm going to have to ask you to leave the store because we will not serve somebody as disrespectful as that. And she got irate and started to scream at him and swear at him. And then when she finally stormed out of the store, uh, Joey turned around, he opened his own wallet and gave a $20 bill to that blind man. And then Joey went back to work. That is kindness. That is love meeting vulnerability. And we get to offer help to a lot of people because a lot of people are going to need it. This week, this month, there will be many that you will come across who are going to be in some form of need. And kindness is offering the help that we can. So we build others up with kindness. And then we build others up with patience, by showing patience. Verse 5 says, love is patient. You see, uh, patience is what love looks like in the presence of failure. So, for example, if you're on the parkway and somebody fails to drive with sufficient safety and cuts you off, that's a moment that you can show patience. I mean, we can explode in anger or show patience and choose not to, to uh, explode. You see, um, this is the option we have. Instead of rejecting somebody, instead of exploding on somebody, patience is not just waiting for somebody who's late. Patience is, is actually bearing with somebody who's not strong or has even failed. Uh, my parents live in a retirement center right now. And so when I visit them, I see a lot of people that are over the age of 80, over the age of 90, and I was at a table uh, a little while back with my father, and there were some other guys there, some of them who had some dementia issues. And uh, as we were chatting, one of the guys was talking to me about his time in the military and then in the Army. And he was telling some stories that may be a little repetitive and didn't all make sense. Uh, and I thought to myself, okay, this is a chance to show patience instead of cutting them off, instead of just bailing out. I, uh, I locked in eyes with him and nodded at the appropriate times. And, you know, we all are going to be coming across, again, people who are in some form or another uh, needing our patience. I am very grateful for how so many people have shown patience to me, you know, when I've messed up and, and that's so valuable. And, of course, I'm really grateful for God who's shown patience with me when I've messed up and sinned along the way. And aren't you glad for God's patience with us, that he shows kindness towards us and, and his, uh, his forgiveness and his mercy? That's love in action, to show patience. So if you'll notice, 1 Corinthians 13 gives us a lot of direction that's all giving-oriented, not about receiving. When speaking about love... It's about the other person. It's about how we act toward the other person. It's expressing affirmation instead of expecting it. You know, it's, it's giving uh, help and not demanding it. 
verse 5 says, love is not self-seeking. Because we can't love from a selfish position. Uh, although it's worth pointing out that when we give love, we often receive it back. Maybe not in quite the timing or measure we always expect, but we do. It comes back. And so 1 Corinthians 13 is not about waiting to feel some kind of soft-hearted mushiness or muddle-headedness. That's not what it's talking about when it speaks about love. It's specific actions given towards other people, other-centered actions. And that kind of showing of love builds a life that really matters. I want to point out in closing this, that we talk about love as the key. That's what 1 Corinthians 13 says. We can't live a life that has any meaning without showing love. And today, kindness and patience are the foundation for building up other people. Love, kindness, and patience are all fruit of the Holy Spirit. Galatians chapter 5 tells us, gives us a list of the fruit of the Spirit. That is, what are the kind of the, the outgrowths, the outcomes of what happens, what to expect when the Holy Spirit fills us. Love, kindness, and patience are fruit of the Spirit. Which means that when we're hearing today that God calls us to this kind of life, that our life will matter when we show kindness and patience, when we show love, the good news is this, God's not just expecting us to shape up and generate this kind of love. He gives it to us in the first place. When we receive him, his Holy Spirit in us produces this in us. So our response is not work hard, good our teeth. Our response is to say, Lord, I need more of you. Fill me with you so I can overflow the love and kindness and patience that you put in me. So it seems like a good thing to us to do right now to ask for that. Let's bow in prayer right now. Lord Jesus, uh, we are so thankful for the love, the kindness, and patience you've shown us over our lifetime. And today, Lord, we know there are people around us who need this kind of love from us. And so we pray for your Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray right now for all, Lord, who are seeking you, all who today want their lives to matter, and they're asking, Lord, for more of this. I pray your spirit would pour into their lives in a significant way, Lord. Uh, I pray that they would know that you have heard that request, Lord, for more of you. Come, Holy Spirit, fill us where we are needed. Fill us, Lord, where we need more of you. And we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake.